uh, let's sell the farm. And uh, so, I, you know, what I, obviously, I mean, the farm is for sale because everything's for sale, right? Uh, your bees are for sale at the right price and, and uh, everything anybody's got. But, you know, of course, what I mean is how do we promote the farm? And uh, so I gave you that long title, Destination Farming, Agritourism, and Niche Marketing. So we'll talk a little bit about this. This is not a how-to. I want to tell you right up front. So if you're looking for how to make it work, uh, it's not here. It's not going to be in this presentation anyway. This is a little bit of what we've done it's a little bit of philosophy, general concept of, of how other people, how we, what our over, overriding concepts have been in helping us do some of the things that we're doing, um, some of which have succeeded and some of which have failed. And, um, and then it's some resources and it's also some ideas, things that we've seen other people do. And I'll say, and this is the last uh, thing by way of preface, Many of you in this room are already doing a lot of what you're going to see here, or some of what you're going to see here. So my goal for the next uh, 50 minutes is to kind of uh, seed some more ideas for you. So if you leave with one idea that you didn't have when you came in, then I'm, I'm pleased and I hope, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, let's see, I have that, don't I? So just a quick definition, uh, destination farming is anything that you and I do in our businesses that sets us apart. That's pretty simple. So why would anyone come to see you, come to your place? Why do they choose your booth at the farmer's market? Why do they knock on your door for that next quart of honey? There's something that you have that sets you apart, something that's unique that no one else has. So if it's unique, if it's special, it creates buzz, okay, that's the only attempt I'm going to make at any kind of a pun in a bee meeting. Excitement, and then in the customer's mind, you're an experience. So how many of you buy fresh eggs at someone's farm? Right? Quite a few of you. How many of you buy anything like meat or vegetables or anything like that? Actually go to the farm and get that product. Let's see. Let me see a show of hands. A few more hands. Okay. More and more people... Uh, are interested in connecting with the source of their food. You know that. You know that's why you can sell your honey at the farmer's market for the prices that you're getting for it. And you should because it's unique, it's special. No one else has it but you because you produced it there and you're their beekeeper. So you have created an experience for those people. That's what the wine industry has known for 50 years here in the United States in Napa, Sonoma Valley, the California destination vineyards, uh, Finger Lakes in New York, create that experience and people will make the journey, they'll make the trip and they'll show up and they'll want to, to, to have your products. So the second bullet point there, anything that we do that no one else is doing, and that's kind of the key, makes us a destination. We've created an experience, no one else is doing it, they will come from their place to you or anytime they pass through your part of the world, they stop at your place you've become a destination that they look forward to and they plan. And we remember when that happened to us. I didn't even know what a destination was. I didn't know what that meant in tourism terms. And just in the course of talking to our customers, this is 15 years ago when we, were, we just had a little uh, tiny room on the front of our packing plant, 12 feet long and about 12 feet wide and about 20 feet long, 30 feet long. Um, we would ask our customers, where y'all headed? And we started, people, instead of saying, oh, we're headed into Temple to the VA, or we're headed over to Fort Hood, or we're headed down to Cameron, or we're going, we're going from Abilene to, to Houston, we're on that route. Instead of telling us where they were headed, they looked at us and they said, well, we, we came here. We came to your place. We came to get honey. And more and more people were driving to us, and we were the destination. So we figured out what a destination was when we started hearing that. That's because we had something they couldn't get. They were willing to take their time and their effort to do it. And then finally, and this is, this is I don't want to get, this is as deep in the weeds as I get. And in in, we're going to show a bunch of pictures here and just talk. So you're, you're through, you're, it's through with classroom time with this last bullet point here. Creative diversification. And so I know you're not supposed to do like two effects on one word, but I did bold it and italicize it because I want to kind of, I want that to stick a little bit with you. 
Creative diversification is the key to a thriving agritourism venture. So when you get to that point where you've figured out, we can create an experience or two, and then you're hearing from your customers, we came to see you. We, no, we came today. We're not passing through. We came to be at your place. Then what you realize is that you have diversified your business. You're not, a, uh, you're not doing one thing anymore, and you've done a couple of things that are unique, different, special, like we set up in the first bullet point. They've created that buzz, that experience. And so that sounds hard, and I will be the first to admit that I've been a pretty miserable failure in our business at figuring out what that was. Now, thankfully, we have smart people like Tara, and we've got a half a dozen now that are in that young, bright age group that have ideas, and we listen to our customers. I'm going to tell you in a minute a customer story about the ideas. So the, the ideas are there. The, obviously, they're out there on the internet uh, and, uh, and to be had, but your creativity and in diversifying your business, just creating new products and, and broadening your range of offerings is, is critical. I keep setting this thing down. I apologize. I, I just spoke at the Kansas meeting two weeks ago, and I gave four presentations, and they didn't have one of these. Thank you. And so I, it's not like I've never seen one before, and I, I, I do get that, and it actually does that too. Good. But they didn't have that. So there was a guy sitting, and I keep looking for the guy sitting there at the laptop that I can go, now turn that next one, but I'll, I'll get over it here. I'm going to keep it in my hand maybe. So this is, the, this is the customer deal. Bring your own bottle. And it started out, we had this little show, showroom. Now we've got a, a store that we built here about four years ago, and this is in our, that picture is in our new store. And we have five just what we call grocer's tanks. Walter T. Kelly sells them. Some of the vendors out here will sell you uh, jacketed. It's got a water jacket on it so you can heat it. And a lot of you use these in your honey bottling. So people were looking through a glass window in the old store into our packing room. And the crew was sitting back there bottling. And some customer comes in someday and says, hey, if I bring my own bottle, does it save me and you some money? And we immediately, that, that was, we said yes, so we found out right then we were doing BYOB. That, we didn't put a sign up, we just started doing it. And the customers can't get that anywhere else. That's the eggs at the back door I was talking about. That's going out to the farm and getting your farm-raised beef, your grass-fed pasture beef. Because you showed up and actually brought your own jar and got your honey from the tank at the beekeeper's place. This creates a destination event. And this creates loyalty. And I have Michael up here and Tara and Domingo smile because they know Michael well. Michael has been buying, filling that same gallon jug. We've asked him if we could replace that label. He just tapes more tape on it. He does, he, that's kind of his badge of honor. He wants it to come in and wants everybody to see him bring that gallon jug in empty and leave with it full with a label that we retired maybe, I don't know how, how long ago. But if customers just bring their jars in and, uh, and we fill them while they wait. And now, since we moved in the store and we have a little more room, we have four more tanks, so we have some of varietal honeys. Uh, we've always just sold them our local wildflower honey. That was your option if you wanted BYOB. And then when we had a little space, we put in some more options. But Michael can't go anywhere else and get that. He pays a little more for that honey in BYOB. We can sell it to him cheaper. He pays a little more for that BYOB honey than he would pay for imported honey at Sam's or another big box store. So you talk about loyalty, my goodness, and, uh, and it does save us money. And, but the main thing is they can't do that anywhere else but our place. And then we're in Texas, and we started making, I guess, I don't know, I'd maybe have to ask Domingo, we started uh, dealing with Oliver Pecan. Well, they started buying honey from us, a San Saba Pecan Company. They had a bad experience with some honey. We, we knew it was imported honey, turned their uh, pecan honey butter green. This was back in the 90s, in the 1990s. And they've never shopped honey from anybody but us. For uh, We're closing in on 20 years with them as a customer. So there's our customer that's buying our honey, and we're saying, what are you making with our honey? Well, we're putting it in our pecan honey butter. Well, we'd like to have some of those pecans. So we started buying the pecans because they're buying the honey, and it made sense to us. And we didn't really have a plan for it, so we developed this pecan pie in a jar. You can see there's more honey in there. The pecans are floating in the top. You can't read that, but that's pecan pie. It's a, a pie, a joy in a jar, I think is what we call it there. 
and then we just pack one straight with a chock full of nuts and, and, and honey in it. And then, of course, customers say, well, I just want to buy some pecan halves. Can you just sell me some pecan halves? Maybe I don't want the honey in it. So we start bagging it there, and then we start making it in our creamed honey. And it was just one thing led the other, but it was really just about us saying, man, we're in Texas, you know. Now, in Kansas, you'll appreciate it. I had to train them on, someone said pecans, and I said, you from Georgia? And they said, well, yeah, I'm from North Florida. I said, well, that's the same thing. You say pecans. In Texas, you have to pop the pea, and pecans, and I made them do it with me. They enjoyed it. I don't need to do that with y'all. Then, then we started saying, well, we're doing pecans. Let's grind some peanuts. We bought just a little basic peanut grinder, and we started making peanut butter and honey with sea salt, and one we have some chocolate in it. And that just sat there for years and didn't do anything. And, and then a gourmet food company picked it up and put it on their Christmas website. And we, I don't know what we did, a thousand jars for them that Christmas. But the, our website got out there and we got phone calls. And now we're doing, um, I don't know, 90 cases every couple of months for one grocery account and selling it a little bit wholesale otherwise. But it was an opportunity for us to do things with our product and products that we know people love because of where they're from and uh, promote those. We opened up a little cafe. It's just a glorified food truck. If you come out Sunday morning, you'll see it's just a food truck with a nice wood-fired pizza oven in it. And, uh, but we put a cover over it, and we call it the Honey House Cafe. And, and then we start making sandwiches, and our chef makes us this pesto, and people say, well, I want to take some pesto home. Oh, we're glad you said that. We think we'll put that in a jar for you. And so we've got a pretty good little shelf now that's a salsa and a barbecue sauce and uh, some different stuff. But what, why, would we do, why would we care to do that? They evolved naturally through what we were doing. We didn't go out and say, let's make a pesto. But we started, had the, 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 the cafe and then the sandwich got rave reviews and because it had the pesto and can I take it home? And so the, again, the customer tells us where we need to be in the market. But the point is, no, you can't buy these anywhere else. You can go get a barbecue sauce, but if you really liked our mango salsa on those chips you just ate, you know, we're the only ones that have that because we made it, and you create that customer loyalty and brand, brand loyalty, brand identity. There's the Beta Bottle Tours I was telling you about. Uh, this uh, fellow up here is our winemaker, Chase. He's been making our mead for 10 years. We've had groups in, this is a corporate group right here that wanted to know about uh, beekeeping and uh, came in and did it. Um, this is a group of students from Texas A&M right here, and actually we opened a beehive and handed them frames of bees that day. We don't typically do that, but they, they wanted to see it, and we prearranged it, and we did it. But um, we just, um, I, I thought this was going to fail when a year and a half ago, maybe we've been doing this maybe almost two years and the crew said, well, we just, people are asking, can they tour the farm? And we'd always done it for special groups, uh, you, educational groups and things like that. You do that. You do little tours for people sometimes. And, uh, they, but they want to do it regularly, every first Saturday of the month. And, I was, and they're charging, they're, you're, it's free for you Sunday morning. But we charge $5 a head for this. And I said, well, how long do you think it's going to take for everybody in Bell County that's willing to pay $5 to tour a bee farm to get that out of their cycle, out of their system? I said, that's going to last three months tops. And we're at two years, and we sell out at least one, sometimes two, and even three tours the first Saturday of every month. And so it's way beyond what I could imagine, but, you know, it, it is something people want to do, get out on the farm and have the experience. Here's something that probably as much as anything else um, is uh, something that I want to recommend that you not do. <laughs> I'm going to show you a video in a minute and you'll see why. You, you, say, you shake your head and say, no, I, I'm not doing that. But we had an energetic uh, store manager uh, six years ago and she said, you know, we're, we've defined ourselves as being natural good for you products and we're the farm and people come to us as the farm but there's so many farms around us and we could name at that time five to ten that are producing vegetables and maybe selling them in one restaurant or maybe selling the CSA box of vegetables kind of thing uh, or doing pasture fed beef and things like this 
And she said, they don't have an outlet. They have to go to the farmer's markets. They have to go knock on the doors at the restaurants. Wouldn't it be great if we threw a market twice a year and we invited all of those local people to come in that have the same philosophy of agriculture and farming that we have and give them a, an outlet, a venue right here in their backyard. So just reach out in a net around us and invite these people in. And we did it, and it started small, and maybe we had, I don't know, 20 vendors. And um, Domingo, you got to guess how many people came to that first market six years ago? A few hundred, 500 yeah. You know, not, you know, it was a nice crowd. It was a nice response. And so we thought, well, that's, that's something that we want to continue to do. So we just did our 12th one here in October. That's our little advertising that went in the local papers for back in May. And um, this is a, just a quick video. I don't know if this will play. Uh, do I, do I, yes, it has sound. Uh, you know, I might have should have mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, good time to ask. Uh, and before, oh, I can just, can I just touch it here and make it play, can't I? Is this touch screen? Okay, can I just click and, okay, I'll do that. Let's go back. We'll get there. All right. Oh, I see. I have control, huh? Yeah. See what I did there, No. Uh, nope. Okay, I got it on, uh, yeah, there we go. It's up. It's going to play. Let's see if we got sound. Okay, this was, this was in May. I'll point out a couple of things. We don't need sound. It's, you know what? You don't need to worry about the sound. It's just some country tune. So there's our new store right there. Right there. And we, I think we had, in May, we had 40 vendors. And this one in October, we had 48 vendors. It was wet in May, so we couldn't, so everybody was parking on that U.S. highway out there. But we park. We have about four acres of parking out in here and, and back on the other side of the building. And we had uh, 2,200 people that came out for this in October, and Domingo counts the dogs. We had 30 dogs. <laughs> Don't worry about the sound. Seriously, it's not narrated. It's just music, and we're good. Um, that's our little native Texas garden right there. I'm going to show you a picture of that at the end. Just a berm that we built with native Texas. There's the Honey House Cafe. But you can see we have a really ugly place. You couldn't, you couldn't pick an uglier setting to put your business. I mean, Art, you've been there. It's not pretty. Uh, between a U.S. highway and a railroad track, and it's a long, narrow piece. It's, there's just really nothing attractive about it at all. It's not where you, you, you know, it's not a piece of anybody's beautiful ground uh, sitting out on the bald prairie. There's a little vineyard on the right, right, right edge there. And um, it's about over here. Live music, some grapevines up on the porch. And there's, there you can see the railroad, the trains coming by on one side and the U.S. Highway and a hayfield and plowed hayfield in the background. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, we do have our own little organic garden there. That's our sign out front that we built pretty much ourselves. We had a rock layer come help us finish the, the rocks at the end. Okay, I think I can turn that off. So, but again, the, oh, well, let's don't do that. Let's just go to the next slide and see if that does. There we go. All right, so... That really just came about from us just landing someplace and finally recognizing that we were that destination that we were talking about, that people were coming to us, and was that an opportunity for us to create a synergy with some other local farms. And the folks, the vendors that come to this farm, almost to the person, tell us that the two days that they come to our market are their two best sales days of the year. And they go to a lot of markets. Some of them go to markets every Saturday. Some of them go to the Austin. One of, them, one of the vegetable growers is at the Austin Lake Line Market. And when he comes and sells at our place, he sells more than at Lake Line Mall in Austin. Of course, there you see he's got unlimited competition, and he comes to our place. And so that's what you have going for you is you're where you are. And the reason I pointed out how unattractive our ground is, our space, our, our piece of, of land on the earth 
is that your place is at least that pretty, right? You know, wherever you're going to do your business, you've got things going for you that are about you. And you're in your town, in your county, in your side of the county, in your locale, and you're special and you're unique and no one else has what you have. And that's really, you know, that's really what this is about. Okay, so really this is about recognizing that these people are coming to us so we don't own them as a customer, but they have once been our customer. Today they're our customer. So what are you going to do with them tomorrow? And at some point you have to answer that question and you have to be intentional and serious about it. And many of you are and do that. And you don't just say, well, I'm going to run out of honey anyway. I don't know if they're going to, I don't really care if they come back because it, you know, it may take me two days longer, a week longer to, you know, sell that last jar of honey before my next crop comes in. So that's fine too. That's a, that's a marketing strategy and not a bad one. And if, it, if that's it and it works, then that's what you should do. But once we decided we were all of a sudden, we, in our minds, we had become retailers, which we never sought out to do, and a destination. And so now we want that repeat business because something attracted them in the first place. They're the easiest customer to get to come back is the return customer. The easiest customer to get is the return customer. And so, you know, we just do a lot of the stuff you're already doing, the Facebook uh, stuff. I put this up here because this is kind of like the backroom diagnostics. Man, I can't. Oh, I can see it here. See, I'm just, the technology is right. Okay. Thank you, Tim. 4,364 is the organic reach, it says. And for most of you know more about Facebook than I do. But that just means our Facebook friends saw that and shared it. And that's, our, that's what we were going to get. But then we bought some Facebook ads, and we extended our, we doubled our reach, more than doubled our reach to 4,431 paid reach. Do you know what that cost us for 4,400 more people to see that? That was $70. You can't buy print media for that. And then you, you can go on through the back, back door, whatever they call it, I have no idea, uh, dashboard, whatever. And you can see how many people click through, and then if you just, if I hadn't had to screen print that, you could scroll right on down. How many people actually went to your website, and once they got there, how many clicks they made in your website. All that diagnostic is there, and Facebook gives that to you for free because they want you to realize that if you spend $70 with them, you can double your reach to 8,000 people. And we still do newspaper advertising, and we do the different little slick magazines sometimes, but those things cost money. Here's this little, this little ad here at the bottom is a constant contact that's it's called. It's a little software program, and it helps you stay in touch. If you're sending out an email to your customers, it keeps their email addresses, and you can send them a postcard, a reminder of that sale that's coming up. And this is a chart from October 1 of, to October 20th, from October 1 to October 20th of this year, and it is the growth in our contacts during that period of time. Um, and that is something that, you know, on a monthly basis, you'll have 10 people that say, well, I'm not reading that email. You know how you do, you and I clean out our inbox from time to time, unsubscribe from that Chevrolet dealership that you shopped at or something. And we'll have 10 unsubscribed and about 50 subscriptions and people can come in the store and sign up or sign up online. And that's just something that's just out there, you know, that, that to take advantage of that once people are coming to you, they'll, they'll t and then we don't bother them. We don't, we do a little newsletter once a month and maybe a reminder and try to stay out of their way. And they, they seem to appreciate it. And we can tell by how many clicks constant contact will do what Facebook does. It'll tell you how many people opened it, how many people looked at it and things like that. Um, so I guess that's our, that's, that's another constant contact thing up on the top of, uh, your total contacts that you have. Um, so we've tried a lot of things to get people in the store. We had a, tried a poetry night. That was my idea. So that's how we know we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> I did write some poems. I'm not going to read any of them to you. And then, then, uh, one of our people had an idea of a trivia night and that hit. That stuck, and uh, we've been doing this for maybe two years, and we have a packed house. We can't even have it inside anymore. It has to be out on the porch. It's too many people. We, we got to the fire marshal point, you know, where it's like this is not going to, if the fire marshal comes in, we're in trouble. So we started holding it outside on the porch, 
And you know what? You know why they come? There's pizza, and there is some wine involved, and they play for a bottle of wine. That's that's all. That's all that it is. Is there, the winners get a bottle of wine, but they lo- they come out and they'll eat eat a pizza and play trivia for two hours and have a ball. And it, we do it once a month, and it's always a packed house. Stuff that that happens. About seven years ago, we opened the the winery, Dancing Bee Winery. Uh, it's really a meadery. Uh, we do some grape wines, but we make honey wines with our honey, and uh, that obviously takes makes makes a destination uh, because people will drive for a winery. Uh, we opened the winery and we realized that you know we're Mead and we're not we're not Fredericksburg, right? And we're sure not Napa or Sonoma and we're sitting out here on the bald prairie and and we realize that people that drink mead sometimes come in with a little attitude, you know, a little, there's, there's a little bit of that with, I mean, not mead, uh, wine. And so we thought, well, we're missing a whole group of people. We're missing what we think is the mead crowd out there. And so we built our own, in the homebrew crowd, there's probably five of you in this room will know this term. There's something called a keezer. I'm not getting any nods. Yeah, there we go. Or a kegerator. It's a refrigerator or a freezer that you turn into something that can chill your uh, kegs of mead. So we make little five-gallon kegs of mead. Maybe we're bottling blackberry that week. We'll put the blackberry, some blackberry in the keg and then put it on forced CO2 and serve it right off the tap, just like you see right here. And, uh, and then somebody decided we needed a margarita machine, but of course we got to call it Mitaritas instead of margaritas, and that's a hit during the hot months, and, and we do that there in the store. Here's something that we didn't dream up, but it happened to us, and uh, it, we didn't really understand going in, but we do now. We're real comfortable with it. So this thing called Harvest Hosts is folks who own campers and trailers uh, like that one in the picture there, and you sign up, and you pay Harvest Host for an annual membership, and then they give you the book. It's like the KOA campground book, right? And they give you the book, and they say, this apple orchard in, in Washington State, or this winery in uh, California, or this pick-your-own-pumpkins in Florida, Texas, will let you come and park at the farm if you're self-contained. So it's no RV slots. There's no electricity, no water, no sewer and they pull in self-contained, and so people travel the country, we found out, staying in self-contained, maybe one night a week, or maybe they'll go by a state park and, and dump their vehicle and load up with fresh water and, and uh, you know, buy fuel for their generator. So they'll pull in, and uh, they'll, we, we provide a fire ring, and we'll sell them some wood that we already have for the wood-fired pizza oven, and they'll sit outside in the evening, and they're on our place, and uh, it's just another uh, kind of nice thing that can happen on the farm and, and brings people to you. And then this other thing on the right there called Hip Camp, that's a tenting group, as you might guess from their logo, from the A in Hip Camp. Um, and uh, same kind of thing, you pay them a membership and they tell you where you can tent for free across the country. And so those, those both, and they both solicited us. Don't know how they found us, but I'm pretty sure we didn't find them. And uh, that's been a pretty nice thing. And then this, we never set out to do or anything, but we built this little pergola. Yeah, I think maybe you can see that. So th- this, cu- this wedding couple, this couple that got married there, this structure behind them, we just built that. We thought it was some nice outdoor space, and we hung some lights in it, and you can see it here in the picture. Um, And we just hung some uh, LED lights, some string lights, and then they rented their own tent and brought it out because we really don't have space. We don't have inside space, and you've got to want to, and it's, again, the the train comes by, you know, in the middle of the ceremony. I mean, we're doing vows, and here comes the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. We're a little bit away from the crossing, so it wasn't like he was blowing his horn right out there, but they might have loved that. I don't know. They didn't. Nobody batted an eye. They just kind of... So anyway, we do, uh, we do have a little bit of space in the store. We do uh, Thursday night. Uh, yeah, last night we had a, um, the Chamber of Commerce brought some people out, about 40 people. We do like, call them kind of corporate parties, and they're just looking for a... You know, people are looking for a place to, to get out and do something, and, and you're not in town. 
you know, your place and mine somewhere out in the country, I guess. We uh, have a listing on Local Harvest. Uh, that's an old photo that they've got there, but it tells a little bit about the company. As you scroll down, there's contacts on the right side, but it, again, it's just another, there's a lot of that stuff on the web. Some of you are already on Local Harvest. I know because I saw you there this week when I was looking up our thing. So that's a great little, if you're doing, that's something you need to do now. If you're at a farmer's market or if you're selling anywhere direct to the public, you should have a listing on Local Harvest, and it's free. You just have to keep it updated. All right, here's our little newsletter I mentioned earlier. We just send this out once a month, and I pointed out just this one right here is this little, these people, this is how stuff magnifies for you. There's a little camper. This is a retro camper. They bought a 1950s travel trailer, kind of like uh, Mom, kind of like our mobile scout that we used to pull around. Y'all used to pull us around the country in. Um, and they had refurbed this thing. It was a young couple, just got married, and their business was strictly mailing stuff. And they traveled around the country, went to old bookstores, found books with beautiful pictures in them, cut them out, put them in sleeves, and mailed them to you because you went on their website, and they'd list. If you wanted an anatomy of the, uh, you know, the, the musculature and the uh, human torso, they've got that from a medical book, and they'd ship it to you. So that's all they were doing is driving around the country. But every place they stopped... They would, in exchange for you letting them park free with their camper for several days, they'd blog about your site. So we just got no, no end to the Facebook friends and, and other things. I, again, I, you're talking to a 60-year-old man. I don't even know what we got out of that, but I know we got a lot out of it. And it was just because we were there and were hospitable and, and they came out. Um, that's a better picture of the front of the store. Okay. That's kind of that's kind of what we've done right and wrong and well not right but you know like I say some of it's working and some of it's not but here's some other ideas I don't think we're doing any of these things we well the last one we're getting ready to do some farm to table I think so I'll just start at the bottom then farm to table you you've seen that if you haven't google it it's really cool vineyards do it a lot orchards apple orchards uh, uh, olive orchards in California and South Texas Anybody that's got some space that you can get people out into, you can set the table right out there in the field, right out there in the pasture, and you serve a meal. And we're working with some of these local vendors that come to our market, and, a, and a, we've got a gal here in Temple that does ready-to-eat meals that are all natural and, and healthy and good for you, and she's going to cater it, and the three of our farms are going to supply food, and we're going to rotate it around to some different farms. We haven't done it yet, and maybe one of those things, if, I, if you see me next year, you can say, how did that work? And I'll say, well, that bombed too. But it might work, and, but we're, it's another way to get people out. The next to the bottom one you're familiar with, um, Community Supported Agriculture, or CSA, and a lot of CSAs do boxes, and it's, the idea is it spreads the risk out. So your customers are already saying, we'll buy a membership to buy a box of food from you once a month or once a quarter for the next year, and they pay you before you grow the crop. And so you already know I've got a built-in, I'm going to sell this many radish, bunches of radishes and this many you know, heads of garlic because it's going in the box and I've already got the boxes sold. And, but there's no reason. I don't know if anybody's doing it with honey, but you know, if you have the friends that can stu help you stuff the box, by friends I mean other farms, and you go together, I don't know if there's a model for that, but it seems like there could be. Or maybe you just, what we've done before is just sold the honey to the farmer who was putting our honey in the CSA box. We did that for about a year. And uh, they would just, you know, tell us that next week we need four cases of that honey. Again, they put one in each box. Association links. Uh, I'm going to, I think I've got some of that coming up. I won't say anything about that now. Offer classes. How many of you in here offer a beekeeping class, right? I know a lot, yeah. Because I, I hear about your stuff, and you're already out there doing that, communicating with the public. But you know a lot more, and probably some of you are doing more than I know some of you are doing the candle and soap making classes. But mead making, brewing, you don't have to have a winery. You don't, if, you're a, if you're a home brewer, and you've got a beekeeping, you know, a way to contact the public to let your people know, hey, I'm making a honey ale, and if you want to come, it's, here's the X dollars for the supply, and when you leave, you're going to have a five-gallon carboy of... Uh, mead or beer or whatever to take home and put, you know, put under your stairs and, and see to fruition. 
whatever. That's a, you know, people, people will do that way beyond what I thought they would. Um, corn or hay maize, uh, there's people that now will actually come in and custom plow and plant your field for a corn maize or a hay maize. You can look that up on the internet and hire those people and they'll come do it for you. Boy, you're an instant destination if you do that for the fall. Uh, bed and breakfast with tiny Texas homes. If you've got a piece of rural property and you've got any kind of a destination going on, that's kind of like feeding off of the, the RV hip camp kind of thing um, and or RV hookups, the top one there. I'm, I'm hunting and pecking there, but moving around. Cooperate with other local businesses. Uh, we've done a little co-promotion with some of our neighbors that are within 10 miles of us. Some of them are already buying our products, and, and but we try to advertise together when we can and, and draw people out to our rural east side of this county that you're in. You don't know it, but, but from here west in this county, there's a half a million people between here and the, east, the, the western edge of this county. And from here east, there's, what are there, 400 of us? I don't know. I'm, not, I'm kidding. But if you get just right on the, here on the east loop of Temple, which we're basically on, and head to the east side of the county, there's about a third of, about a third of the ground as there is west of us toward uh, Temple, Belton, Harker Heights, Nolanville, Colleen, Fort Hood, and then you're into the next county, Coppers Cove, and it just keeps the population center. But we're in a little rural east side of the county, and so we have to work to get these people to drive out to us. And uh, so we, we do what we can with the other local businesses. We've got some cool people there that we can work with. But uh, we, and we haven't done anything like this, contact the bus and tour lines. We, we see the big buses come by and sometimes they stop, but they're, you know, we just haven't got out there and contacted them. And, but that's available you know, uh, to you when, you when you have a destination, all right? So here's some of your resource links. I'll, I'll leave this up there for a minute. That top one, I apologize, is really hard to see, but let me do it first. That's Cornell University. You can see in the middle of that long website there, essex.cce.cornell.edu, resources, getting started in agritourism. That's a great site, uh, but you can just go to cornell.edu and do agritourism as some great Great resources out there. USDA has their own uh, agritourism thing. I don't know why they call it the National Agriculture Library, but that's where you access what the government has uh, in the way of resources for uh, agritourism. And then um, UC Davis, uh, California, has this um, nice website there, sfp.ucdavis.edu, agritourism. All right, and then um, right here at home, so I don't get yelled at by Dr. John Thomas for not promoting Texas A&M. How you doing, John? Yes, I know you are. Good to see you. Uh, Texas A&M has, uh, through their AgriLife extension, let's see if I can harvest. Yeah, naturetourism.tamu.edu, naturetourism.tamu.edu, and then... The bottom thing is if you do become, if you do really get into, you know, agri, agritourism, there is a national organization for that, the North American Farmers Direct Marketing Association, and they have resources and promotion and stuff like that. All right, I've got about, that's just a little picture of our, our native Texas garden. Okay, I'll tell the story since I've got 10 minutes. So... Domingo and Tara will remember when we built that store, there was just this kind of low spot out there to the, uh, as you face the store off to the left, and we had a really wet winter when we built the store, and the water just stood from like December until May, and it was about an inch or two deep, and then it would dry up, and then it would rain, and it'd be an inch or two deep, and it'd stand there for a week, and so I was having a really nice, leisurely Saturday morning at home, taking a day off, and and drinking my coffee, and Janice said, how long are you going to let that water stand there in that hole? I said, well, you know, it'll quit raining, and that was not a good answer. And so after about a cup and a half of that, <laughs> I thought, you know, this would be a good day to go fire up the John Deere. So we had a pile of dirt that we, it's, if you come out, you'll see our pile of dirt. It's still there. It's been there since 2004 when we built our extracting plant and our 
our uh, honey house, and we excavated in this black land. You've got to excavate, excavate and put in uh, select fill, or you can't pour a slab, and that it'll just crack right up. So this pile of dirt, and I just got up there and started hauling dirt down there and building this mound, and then some of the guys helped me that week, and we kind of formed it up and laid it out, you know, after we started seeing what it was happening, and just built a big berm. It's just a big berm is all it is, a bunch of dirt with some rocks around it, and we just, and then that same month, I was speaking at the uh, State Association for the um, Texas Master Gardeners Association, and it was here in Belton at the Expo Center where we've been meeting, you know, the last two years. And they said, well, what, what's your honorarium? What do you require to be paid for your speaking? And I said, well, I would just like for people to bring me a, a bulb or a root or a shoot off of their favorite plant that they've got in their garden at home. So I got this native plants from all over the state brought, given to me out of pickup load. <laughs> took us longer to plant it than it took us to build this, uh, this thing. And then it, uh, the next spring it was covered in blue bonnets, and it, it goes through cycles, but we, we attract monarch butterflies to the blue mist flower. We've got several kinds of cactus and a lot of salvias that the bees love. Seven species of bees on any good warm spring or fall day, you can count seven species of native bees, including our exotic honeybees. So it's been, it became a big draw, and all it was was Janice wanting to know how long I was going to let that water stand there. It, just, it happened, you know, again. And so that, that's really, this is emblematic of what I'm trying to say is, there, you know, whatever, whatever you have, whatever you're sitting on or staring at, back to that term I, try, I was trying to introduce us to up front, just creative diversity. Just, if you like it, do it. We started making peanut butter because I wanted some homemade peanut butter, and I'd always wanted to own one of those machines, and I thought... Janice let me buy it if it was for the business. So I said, we'll make some peanut butter. We'll make something. But I wanted peanut butter. So it happens naturally, organically. Your customers ask for it. They're, they see it. They want it. And they're telling you about it. You, I, I know that's happened for you many times at the farmer's markets. Okay, so enough about that. And we've got eight minutes. Am I right, Tim? Is that three o'clock? You want me down a little sooner? Anybody? Okay, question. Anybody got a, anybody got a question? All right. Yep. I think you're asking if we have to have a commercial kitchen, commercial. Yeah, we have a food manufacturer's license, so we're above the cottage, new cottage law, right? But many of you have had in the past that food manufacturer's license when you get that certain level. Our cafe is licensed, so that's a state thing, and they come out and do their inspection once a year. Um, and the fee is not, oh, it's by volume, it's by your gross sales, so it's not exorbitant, it just matches what level of business you're at. Then for the cafe, we have the county health inspection, just like they would for any restaurant, although the inspection for a mobile unit is a lower bar, that's not to say there's anything wrong with your sandwich Sunday morning, it's still a good sandwich, it's clean. But anyway, they come out and they, they assess it, and you have to, of course, you have to get your trailer inspected like it were a trailer you're going to pull. Now, we're just putting in, you, if you, you, you'll see we've got a new slab poured. We're adding some warehouse space, mostly a little winery tank room, uh, increasing the size of our coal box. But we're putting in a little kitchen first, and we will get a, what's called a commercial kitchen license for that, so we can do uh, acid canning, you know, uh, water, high water activity. Some of you know a lot more about this than I do, but anyway. So, so a few licenses there to, yeah. You know, yeah, her question is at what point did we get that license? For the, we pulled the first food manufacturer's license before we built our honey bottling plant there in 2001. We had it at our, we had, uh, an old mercantile building, a big cavernous thing. Uh, some of you were in it back before 2004 uh, when we finally moved everything up uh, on the highway to this site. But we, we had a food manufacturer's license then. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. Somebody in this room does, but it's not me. I don't, I don't really know what, it, what that threshold is. But check out that cottage law because you can stay under that cottage law for a long time. I think that's the answer to your question is read that cottage law and when you get above that, when you exceed that threshold, that's when you need what's called a food manufacturer's license and that's the, depart, 
DSSA, Department, DHSS, Department of Health Services, but there's another S in there. It's state. Yeah. Another question? Okay. Yes. T. Lee. You bet. Good question. And these, these agritourism sites all address specifically the liability for that. We were just in Kansas, I told you, and the Can Kansas has a new law. Uh, actually, it's, their, their law was poorly written when, they first, when it passed the legislature last year, and they've shut down all tractor rides in the state because the law was written so badly, people say we can't comply. So, but in Texas, if you just have a liability policy and people, and, and most agritourism, most states are trying to create this for agritourism, you know you're going onto a farm. You know there's machinery, you're going onto a honey farm, you know there are bees, you might get stung. Your general liability policy, they tell us, should cover you for that, although as we grow, we've increased our coverage. I will say that. We, you know, we're, we're getting less, we're getting more risk averse, I think, the more people we're seeing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for having me. We've had good speakers today, right? And you're going to have a treat because you're going to get Dr. Dewey Karen again.